All righty, thanks, Brittany. Welcome everybody to the Monday, June 27th, Planning, Development and Environmental Quality Committee. We have uh, legislators Randy Brown here in Chambers, Henry Grandison and Deborah Dawson, legislators on Zoom, and Greg Mezzi, uh, legislator, asked to be excused. Something about he just got married over the weekend and he didn't realize there were things to do after the wedding, especially when you have your family in town. So he was very apologetic and I told him not to worry. Uh, he was he will uh, watch it, the, the meeting again, especially wanted to see the food systems plan presentation, but he'll watch that again on Zoom. So thank you everybody else for coming. And so, um, We'll, uh, we have a few other people here in the chambers. We have uh, Lisa Holmes, our administrative, uh, our administ county administrator. And uh, I want to introduce Bridget real oh, quick. Sure. And joining us today is Bridget Nugent, our new deputy county administrator. Good afternoon, so, everyone. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. And Brittany uh, Grape, our clerk. And uh, Brittany, do we have any public comments? We do not. Okay, great. We're going right ahead on schedule. Uh, we do have uh, a fairly full schedule, and uh, I'll remind, we'll try and uh, keep to the time frames that uh, we have in here, and I'll try and remember to let people know how much time they have when they uh, have their sections, so we can try and stay on time. So I appreciate everybody's help with that. We do have uh, one change to the uh, agenda that we wanted to make sure that the uh, resolution that the food systems plan folks uh, sent us that that got uh, we didn't get that pulled out there's a resolution at the end of their presentation so we kind of didn't get that pulled out as a separate resolution so i'd like to move that we take the resolution which is already in the packet um, but uh, so two things is to pull it out and add it to the agenda so that we can formally vote on it and the version that I'd like to have, um, that I'd like to move is the version that Brittany emailed us out. It's just a really uh, minor, um, you have should have it in, uh, in paper here, those folks in person, you should have it by email that Brittany sent out for those folks on Zoom. Just a minor wording at the very end, just to make it uh, so that this is uh, from recommended by PDEC and we're asking the legislature to adopt it at their next meeting. So it's just very minor wording on that. And so can, uh, would someone, so I, so would someone like to second that of adding that to our agenda? So Randy seconds that. And so let's have a, a vote on adding that resolution to our agenda, accepting the Tompkins County food system plan. And that would be put in right after their presentation. So I'll do a vote, Randy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Deborah? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that's added. Thank you everybody for, for helping us with that. And then we have the minutes approval. These are the minutes from our meeting of May 23rd. Would someone like to move those? I can move those. Okay, Deborah moves that, seconded by Randy. And let's do another vote. I'll go in the same order for this meeting, just so it's easier for folks uh, when I'm asking for your votes. Randy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Thank you. I'm a yes. So that's the minutes pass unanimously. Thanks, Brittany, for doing those. And then next on our agenda is the chair's report. Uh, the only thing I... I have right now is I just wanted to say I went over this past weekend in the town of Ulysses to the old county home. Also, I heard it's also called the old county poorhouse. And if folks aren't familiar with that, you could look that up. There's some things on, on online uh, years ago for uh, it was eight, I want to say 1873. I'll have to look up the info and, and uh, I'll mention it again in our next legislature meeting, but 1870-ish uh, for people who were homeless. That was our first homeless place. And uh, it was put in the town of Ulysses, Route 96 and Perry City Road. And it uh, closed in, I want to say 1970s, mid-1970s. Oh, I'm sorry, no, uh, 1980, 87. Yeah. I was wrong, 87. 
1987, there were still people there. Uh, so it was for people that were various reasons, but mostly poor, couldn't afford a place to live, children, adults that were there. Farm too. There was a working farm, 200 acres working farm. It was yep. quite interesting. Yep. Yeah. So I went to a dedication for a, a historical marker and the new owners that have it, they talked about uh, what they might be able to salvage in some of the buildings. They're, they're quite, uh, quite out of, uh, they're in disrepair, but they're, it was interesting to be able to take a look at them. So that's all I had right now. And um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Lisa or you said Katie also might have something from, from planning. planning. So I'll yes. open up to you guys if you have any reports. Sure. So from county administration, I don't have much of a report. I know that there are a couple of items though that Katie was hoping to update the committee on regarding uh, broadband and uh, uh, the RFP for centralized code enforcement. So I'll, I'll yield my time for Katie to make those brief updates. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for uh, sharing your time with me today. I appreciate that. Um, the first one I wanted to let the committee know about is just an update on the over-target request that was uh, legislator filed for our 2022 budget regarding uh, $75,000 to hire a consultant to do a countywide code enforcement study. Um, the money was put in our budget with the understanding that we would kind of co-lead this study with the assessment department. And the goal was to review and evaluate um, possible centralization of uh, code enforcement services uh, at the county level. And I just wanted to update you all that um, my department assessment and the county clerk um, have all heard from municipalities, uh, several of them, um, that there isn't much appetite uh, for full consolidation of code enforcement services. And uh, staff have raised some concerns that Doing such a study could be viewed as an attempt of some kind of overreach of the county and damage relationships with our municipalities. So we wanted to um, update you all on, on some of that information and uh, just make a recommendation, I guess, from our staff that we think that the study should be um, looking at the different areas of potential collaboration and efficiencies. Um, that the municipalities would both benefit from and uh, embrace more readily, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that includes uh, possible consolidation, efficiencies, training, technology, all around uh, code enforcement issues. And if there's little enthusiasm, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a frog, um, expressed by most municipalities in the county for doing a centralized code enforcement, um, and we would recommend that we instead explore kind of an opt-in um, model where municipalities who want to participate um, could do so on a contractual basis. Um, we'd like to release an RFP hopefully by the end of this summer. And the plan right now is for uh, Lisa and Darby to uh, bring to the municipalities on July 7th, um, this question of whether what they're interested in the county studying that would most benefit them in the realm of code enforcement. And so that would be brought to the local officials call that um, is continuing to happen. Um, so just wanted to, to update you all on that. And um, I've got Darby on the call as well, uh, who is gonna be the lead in the department on this topic. If you have any questions or input you'd like to share with us. Um, Katie, so T TCOG has, um, has not moved it forward any? Into well, it's not a TCOG study. We, we did right. bring it to them for their, like, to, just to let them know about it. Um, I believe Martha Robertson was the lead spokesperson on that, uh, when we brought that to them in the fall. And at the time, there were probably three or four municipalities that pushed back pretty hard on the idea of having um, any kind of centralized code enforcement. So I guess that's just where uh, multiple departments are, are hearing more um, from municipalities on this topic. So we wanted to make you all aware of it. Thanks. 
Thanks. I just want to make one quick comment and then we'll go to Deborah. The, the way that I always looked at this was, you know, as uh, kind of what Katie's saying are what efficiencies, trainings, you know, things would the municipalities like us to help coordinate, you know, if, if we could, you know, it doesn't mean we, we would be able to provide that, but just to see if there were some, you know, as you said, efficiencies, trainings, uh, maybe there were some services that we could contract with them. Uh, what uh, my recollection of how this came about was talking about uh, the various different um, uh, staffing, some sometimes there's staffing issues, you know, is there some retirements coming up, you know, municipalities, you know, is there some way that we could be, a, could be of help? We have, whether it's a affordable housing, regular housing, there's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, different, uh, for instance, al alternative energies like solar farms going in, wanted to see how we could help with that. We we're certainly, you know, as a county as a whole, at least from my perspective, wanted to make sure we uh, help as much of those uh, projects go in and so that they're easier for the, 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 the developers, also easier for the municipalities when they have something come to them versus maybe they, they're prepared, whether it's model codes or some way to, so that they don't go, okay, Town of Ulysses, it's, this is the procedure and this is the code versus you go to the Town of Enfield or Newfield, it's completely different. Um, and I'm not saying it has to be all the same, of course, because those municipalities have the right to, to have those codes how they want them um, in the zoning, but just wanted to see how we could make things easier. For instance, like say about of housing, we need more housing. So how can we do that? And how can we help the municipality? So that was just from my perspective. So thanks for listening, Deborah. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, I'm not surprised that there's pushback on complete consolidation because I think a lot of our constituent municipalities probably figure that that takes away a lot of what they consider their home rule authority. Uh, do you have any sense for how much room there is in other areas for cooperation and efficiencies, et cetera, or are we just spinning our wheels? You know, um, we met with Maureen and Alana and Jay uh, Franklin and uh, especially the county clerk has been working closely with uh, municipalities. And, and I think uh, Alana has been kind of the point person on that. And I think she sees a lot of room for potential okay. efficiencies and improvements. And in right. fact, some of the municipalities are already taking steps to share platforms for some input. And um, I think there's a, a, a great room for, for coordination and uh, just tracking things. Oh, Darby, you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Deborah, as I've been working on the RFP, I've been keeping a list of possible shared services, you know, just beyond the code enforcement that they do. And I have a list of like 25 items on it from every everything from shared software to sharing fee structures and templates and solar permits and you know, swimming pool permits. So there's like a bunch of things that could be done across the board by um, you know, a, a countywide system. So there's there's a lot of things for folks to consider of like, yeah, what what could we relinquish or share or work um, through differently? And I, yeah. so, yes, lots of things. Thank you, Darby. That's encouraging. Great. Any other feedback? Randy, did you have anything or we have our no, administrators here? Anybody else want to chime in on anything? Just echoing what Katie said, I was attended that meeting as well. So it, it does seem that there's um, plenty of room for collaboration. It's just how how we approach it with the municipalities, I think will be important to, um, you know, in the spirit of collaboration and not attempting to um, to take control. Um, Randy, go ahead. Um, actually, I was the jump code officer for Newfield mm -hmm. um, and a thankless job. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the, uh, the laws reverted back to state law quite a bit. And, and we did call often call the health department because we didn't know what to do, right. um, especially when it came to animals or junk or kids involved or, or whatever. Um, but I know every town struggles with that. 
Mm -hmm. I don't, and the other thing that I know that um, Newfield and Enfield struggle a little bit is management of their websites and the data that goes into them uh, and how it's current or not current, how it aligns with Tompkins County, you know, uh, better than it does. Mm -hmm. um, so information shared better. So it's been okay. Right. I will just say, just uh, having have uh, gotten a little shed that went over the the um, the permitted square footage. It's over 144 square foot for the town of Ulysses. I had to actually go wind up going in in person to fill out a permit. So that's you know I, I was surprised that I couldn't just either just download it. Well, I, I could print it out, but that really didn't help me a lot. I still had to go in. So it was like, well, how does that help me much to print it out at home when I still have to physically walk it in, you know, for a shed, right. <laughs> you know, right. where I can't remember what the fee was, but it would have been great if I could have just put that up online. And that makes it easier for, you know, anyway, any, any more, we, any way we can streamline these services. So thank you, Darby and, and Katie, any, anything else? that you guys have to report or anything else on that topic? Uh, no more on that topic, but I have one other topic that I was co-opting Lisa's time for if uh, if we could move on to broadband. Sure. <clears throat> um, so uh, Nick has joined me. Uh, he's been leading the RFP process for broadband consultant selection <laughs> and we're getting close to contracting um, with a, a consultant and so uh, we wanted to make sure to update the committee on the process that was used and kind of where we're at. So, Nick, do you want to yeah. take it away? Yeah, sure. Well, we'll keep it we'll keep it quick here. But I uh, just had a, had some updates we wanted to make sure everybody was on aware of. Um, so back in April, I think we we shared some notes of what we were doing at that point uh, in terms of uh, uh, putting together a. Uh, RFP and some of the services we were looking at. There are sort of seven tasks uh, that were included in that RFP, including review of the prior data, uh, identification of funding sources, assistance with grant applications, uh, engagement with uh, our ISPs, uh, internet service providers, um, uh, development of methods to expand broadband, uh, assistance with implementing that, and then analysis of technical specifications. Uh, so um, we, we released that RFP back in April. Uh, uh, we got uh, three responses to that RFP. Uh, we decided uh, we had a, a committee here uh, composed of both uh, uh, staff from the county uh, and uh, two outside uh, advisors uh, to review those uh, responses and, and score them. And we decided to um, interview all three of those uh, firms. Uh, there was a, after the interviews, there was a, there was a clear uh, front runner, I'll say, uh, and that, that also bore out in the scoring that the um, uh, uh, evaluators did. So we had a made a selection, uh, and the firm that we found was uh, ECC Technologies. Um, they're um, uh, based out of the, sort of the Rochester area, but they work around the state. And actually, it's the firm that the state uh, hired to do the recently released uh, broadband map that a few of you, I think, have, have seen in, in the news over the last couple of weeks. Um, so. Uh, we uh, just uh, uh, completed the draft contract for them and sent that over on Friday. Uh, so it's not, not under contract yet with ECC, but I expect that'll be shortly. Uh, we'll get that sorted out. Uh, so uh, yeah, they've got a, they've got a pretty uh, well thought out process and, and a very uh, robust team. I think we're looking forward to working with them and, and getting this underway. I think they've, they've helped some other communities that were in very similar positions and, and dealing with their broadband uh, challenges. So uh, feel, I think, uh, you know, speaking for myself and, you know, uh, feel pretty confident that we've got a, a good team uh, on our side to help us uh, figure out how to get broadband uh, available to the, you know, anyone in the county who is uh, lacking it currently. So uh, we'll um, likely need to come back to the legislature sometime in the fall once we have a, a methodology sort of planned out and how to, how to um, uh, tackle this. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, there'll be more. This is not the end of the story. Uh, so, uh, but this is an important step. And I think it's getting some, some really talented folks who know this industry well on our, on our team. So um, I think that's basically it. And uh, happy to answer any questions if y'all have any. Great. Thanks, Nick. Any, any questions? 
Okay. okay. Yes. I think Henry, uh, Henry's sorry, got a question. Henry, go ahead. Yes, and I, I, I've been talking to Nick about the governor's plan. Any update on the um on the governor's on the governor's broadband release? On on the government's uh, sorry, I just missed the on last the bit. governor's on the governor's map and the governor's broadband release. Any way yeah, that can help the, us? So I sent a message when I saw that message that come came through that the the you know state website was launched. I, I reached out okay. to our um, contacts over at the the state uh, DPS uh, to uh, to ask if they could release the data in a format that would let us you know plug it into a you know a, a, to compare to different things and, and get a better sense of it. Um, they're they're reviewing that request. They haven't they've acknowledged that they got it, but I haven't gotten it back yet. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think we'll, ha we'll find a way to get that data one way, you know, we'll, we'll sort it out. Uh, so it may take a little time and a little, uh, a little, uh, um, uh, you know, more forceful request. We'll figure it out. Uh, but the, yeah, that, that's, that data set is out there. That's going to be really helpful because it combines both the, um, physical survey of the, all of the the broadband infrastructure that's out there with um, data that was uh, uh, provided by ISPs. Um, so, uh, and it's been checked. You know, the, we had some data earlier that had was you know very raw data hadn't been checked, hadn't been you know verified. This this data has been 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 verified. So I think it's it's as good a data sets as we're going to have. And to my understanding, it's going to be how the state's going to allocate funding. So it's important to know what they're considering unserved. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Randy. Uh, yes, so this contract will first identify where uh, broadband is not available. Is that, and then, and then present ways to solve it? Is that? The yeah, yeah. We we are we already have some good data sources on where it's not available, and from a previous study that was uh, you know running last year, and from um, other sources, uh, including uh, an inventory that ECC. Uh, has been working on. Uh, so we, we have some of that data already in hand, so we'll be kind of consolidating all that and looking at it. Um, uh, but a lot of the work will be done in, in figuring out how do we how do we expand it to those places that lack it? What do we, you know, some, some communities have gone the route of issuing an RFP for uh, the uh, internet service providers to respond to. Um, some communities have found ways to do revenue sharing agreements with um, one or more internet service providers so that they can uh, help fund those expansions. Um, so we're looking into, you know, we're going to have a, a variety of options we're going to talk through ECC with and, and figure out what one serves our community best. Thank you. Thank you. And um, would you also like to uh, just briefly talk about the workshop that you and Katie and I are going to tomorrow in, in, uh, in Binghamton? Oh, sure. Yeah. The, the Southern Tier 8 is hosting a broadband workshop tomorrow. They've got a variety of speakers. I don't have the, the list in front of me right now, but um, it's a, you know, nearly full day agenda. I'll focus on broadband with uh, uh, some industry leaders, some municipal representatives. So yeah, we're hoping to learn a lot there. And, and, I, and I, I'm aware that several folks from ECC will be there too. So I think we'll uh, get a chance to pick their brains a little bit. Oh, great. I look forward to meeting them. So thank you for inviting me to go with uh, you and Katie. Okay. Anything else? Uh, uh, from Nick or Katie? Nope, that's it from us. Thank you. And thank you, Lisa, again for sharing your time. And thank you. And I know you had some uh, new folks coming through. Uh, so we'll so we'll get to uh, see them again. Did you want to just say their names yet or you want to wait till another meeting? You have some new staff? Sure. They're, I think you might be able to hear them in the background with Nick, but uh, we have two new people starting today. Uh, Abigail Connor, who's going uh, to be our environmental planner, and uh, Haley DeLeese, who is the sustainability coordinator. So we're excited to, to welcome them to the team. And we have another planner starting in August, Elliot, uh, to be the housing planner. So we'll be fully staffed soon, which will be exciting. That's really exciting. So congratulations. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. And we'll see you at eight o'clock, I think, right? Yep. I'll, I'll see you at eight o'clock in the morning. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. We'll see you then. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's see. And um, next, we have uh, Workforce Development Office uh, has a resolution. 
So, oops, I don't, yeah. Okay, so, huh. So we don't see anybody here for that. I can speak to it. Oh, okay, so, yeah, so that we, if we can go ahead, if you don't mind. So sure. I'll, I'll just uh, say the name of it. So this is from the Workforce Development Office. We don't see any staff here from there right now, but Lisa said she'd speak to that. This is uh, the resolution, uh, packet page 10, authorization to accept charitable gifts from the Park Foundation to support summer youth employment program. And I'll move that, it's, or do I, I, I need to let, members move things right now for this okay so i'll move that can we have a second deborah's second so that's on the floor and lisa holmes said she'd speak to this a little bit sure um this grant was uh, identical to the one received last year um, from the park foundation to the workforce development board to support the summer youth employment program I believe last year they received less money um, than expected from the state and um, the Park Foundation came forward with funds to, to support the, the program to be able to continue um, to serve the same number of youth as in previous years. And they came forward again this year with funding as well. So um, Per, per our policies, we have the legislature needs to authorize grant acceptance and we're just looking for, for that authorization as the summer youth employment program is gearing up. Any questions or comments on that? All right, why don't we go ahead and vote. Randy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Deborah? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that passes unanimously. Thanks, Lisa, for giving us some info on behind that. And next uh, we have uh, Leo Riley from our material, recycling and materials management department. And there's an informational uh, item, a capital payment summary report and a resolution. So hi Leo, how are you? Hello Ann, I'm doing well, thank you. Hello everyone. Good. And did you want to talk about the capital payment summary or do, do you want to just see if there's any questions on it? Yeah, if anybody's got any questions on to it, I can answer it. They're just, uh, just basic, a couple items. Uh, yeah, engineering invoices. And that's package page 15 for folks looking along. Any questions from, from the group on the capital payment summary? Okay, why don't we go right to the resolution? So uh, Leo's bringing us a resolution. That's package page 16, and that's award of bid authorization to execute a contract with West Law Group PLLC for legal services associated with solid waste management procurement and contracts, ID 10999, and I'll move that. Can we have a second from Deborah? Okay, uh, Leo, why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Okay, well, we, um, we received three responses um, from an RFP for the legal services. Um, those legal services relate to our department's procurements um, and our contracts. Uh, I believe right now we uh, contract with the private sector for around $5.5 million annually. Um, uh, so let's see, we had a team that we kind of assembled um, to review these responses and we interviewed those three firms. Um, of course, with Barb um, Ekstrom uh, and myself, along with Bill Troy, uh, the county attorney and uh, our engineering consultant, Scott Norstrand. So the four of us uh, uh, reviewed their responses. We had a chance to interview them. Um, all of us uh, agreed. Uh, it was it was pretty clear that the most qualified firm was this West uh, West Group Law. Uh, they're based out of White Plains, I believe. Um, they provided the best pr proposal. Uh, they included examples um, of all the services that that we requested, and they showed direct work in these areas as well. Um, and I'm happy to say West Law uh -huh. Group was the low bidder as well. At, $250 an hour. Okay, great. Any, uh, see Deborah has her hand up. Deborah? 
Just a quick question, Leo. Um, what sorts of things are we contracting for? Well, so certainly when we procure for um, our services like uh, the operator of the Recycling Solid Waste Center, when we procure uh, curbside recycling collection, um, we have multiple contracts currently um, that total the 5.5 million. We also have um, some laws that we deal with. Uh, I know you guys mentioned code enforcement. Um, you know, maybe we could talk to Lisa a little bit more about that, but um, yeah, our code enforcement, um, we, we deal with trash tag laws, uh, mandatory recycling laws, illegal dumping, and hauler licensing that we'd be getting some assistance from those uh, law firms as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, why don't we go ahead and vote on this? Randy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Deborah? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that pen is passes unanimously. Anything else from your department, Leo? I don't believe so. We're uh, this week. We're in the process of repaving the entire facility, um, so there's a lot of action going on over here. But it's going to look really nice uh, upcoming weeks. Great, great. I hope that goes smoothly. So, so uh, forget the pun, but <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks. We have a have a good week. You too. Thank you. All right, so we're a little ahead of schedule, knock on wood. Okay, so um, let's see, we have Heather. Heather, are, are you all set? We're a little ahead of schedule. Are you all, all set to go? Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm great. We have uh, 15 minutes uh, slotted for you, but if you need up to 20, but you know, uh, maybe not with this, but... Uh, so you have a resolution. So uh, do you want me to go ahead and introduce it and then you can tell us about it? Sure. Okay, on packet page 17, the resolution, it'll take me probably 10 minutes just to read the title, but okay, so bear with me. Resolution of the Tompkins County Legislature as the elected legislative body of Tompkins County, New York in accordance with section 147F of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 as amended the code approving the issuance by the Tompkins County Development Corporation of its I, its taxable, tax exempt and or taxable revenue bonds, Cayuga Medical Center at Ithaca Inc. project series 2022 in one or more series as part of the plan of financing in a maximum aggregate principal amount not to exceed $27 million for the benefit of Cayuga Medical Center at Ithaca Inc. ID 10998. And then we do have to end the meeting now because that has taken me so long to read that. Now. So Heather, why don't you uh, tell us about this? Why don't you get a second first? Oh, sorry, now. a second. Yes, we do have barely have time for a second. Thanks, Deborah. <laughs> Heather, please tell us about this. Sure. So the Tompkins County Development Corporation, a local development corporation that IAED provides administrative services for, was created pretty much for the sole purpose of providing access to the tax exempt bond market, which is really just low cost financing for area not for profits. Um, the corporation has done this in this capacity for several years. And uh, we've received an application from Cuga Medical Center to help to facilitate the purchase of the former Bonton and Sears stores at the shops at Ithaca Mall um, and renovate both of those facilities, one being clinical services and um, administration back office and the other facility to be a new health training facility. Uh, we are just the conduit issuer. We provide access. Um, the actual um, purchaser of the bonds will be um, Tompkins Community Bank. So everything's staying local. Cool. Um, our biggest competitor in this arena is the New York State Dormitory Authority. And so by using um, the local development corporation, we're, we're able to keep fees local and all those fees support economic development in Ithaca. Tompkins County. 
uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, part, I should say part of the approval process, um, the development corporation does accept the application. They hold a public hearing. Our public hearing is being held tomorrow. Uh, and then the legislature as the legislative body does need to approve the um, issuance of those bonds. So that's why you're involved here. Okay, great. And so that'll come on the legislate come to our legislature meeting the sec the second or third third week in July. Okay, any uh, questions or comments for Heather? Personally, I'm glad. You know, it seems like a win win win. Uh, I'm 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 glad that you're able to help. You know, facilitate uh, the bonding of this. You know, and and to help some. Of, Great activity in, in, in the mall that has been very underutilized and, uh, you know, to help uh, Cayuga Medical Center to use that close by facility and to help keep the uh, funding local. So seems great to me, Heather. Okay, why don't we go ahead and vote on this? Randy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Deborah? Yes. And I'm a yes. So thank you, Heather. And I forgot to formally introduce, I think most people know you, but this is Heather McDaniel, uh, Director of our Ithaca Area Economic Development. So thank you for joining us today. And we have, uh, I don't know if you got to meet our new Deputy County Administrator. Hi, I'm Heather. Bridget. I'm Bridget Nugent. Hi, Bridget. Welcome. I look forward to meeting you in person. <laughs> Thank you. And Randy had a question before you left or a comment? Uh, just a comment. Just wanted to say that uh, uh, we went and met with the uh, um, area development, oh, uh, the new legislatures a uh, week ago Friday. Had a nice lunch and new offices. Very nice. And, and we learned some stuff. So that was helpful. Great. Great. Well, thanks for have, uh, giving them an orientation over there. It's a, it's a lot. I uh, when I remember when I started for something years ago, Heather and her staff actually met with me before I even took office when I was thinking about when I was running for office just to learn. And then again, when, uh, when I uh, got elected and started. So thank you. It's very, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of complicated things they do. So at least for me, it's taken a while to, to, to learn somewhat of what they do. So thank you. Thank you again, yeah, Heather. It's a great opportunity to introduce what we do and um, provide some of the return on investment for some of the projects that we're involved in. And I have a follow-up meeting with uh, Veronica. She was so engrossed in all the things that we do. She wanted to know more. So we're meeting, I think, later this week. Oh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. Thanks, Heather. And you're welcome to stay. And we're having a food systems plan presentation, or if you need to go, we understand. But thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, we are way ahead of time, which is great. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so you guys, Katie's gonna do it from there. Okay, done. Uh, so we have done, uh, we have several people here. So um, uh, who would like to introduce uh, your folks here? Is Katie, you're gonna do the main presentation? Yes, okay. I am. Uh, hi, I'm going to ask uh, you to introduce yourself and the other folks you have here. We have uh, Don in the chamber. You're welcome to sit at the table. Sure. It's up to you. And, um, and before we do that, though, um, we have a couple of people online or on in the Zoom who wanted to come and watch. Uh, see, we have Frank Krupa, our uh, director of health, and Adele Ayers from our DSS department who were interested. I don't know if they wanted to say hi or introduce themselves before we started. Can't hear you, Frank. Hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, Frank Krupa, Tompkins County Public Health Director, Mental Health Commissioner. Adele, I'll leave it up to you if you want to say hi. Okay, they might be listening in. And so, Katie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, we have plenty of time. Um, you're, we have till 3.30, so we have plenty of <laughs> half an hour. 
So you could take a little bit more time if you want, and um, I'll let you introduce yourselves and the other folks, but I wanna say thanks for doing all this work that you've gotten, you know, and, and brought it to this, you know, today. Uh, what we're gonna look at today is they're, they're gonna do the food systems plan. Folks are gonna do a presentation. And then uh, that on our, in your packet that starts on page 21, but there's also a link in there too, if you wanted to see more information about this. And then after they do the presentation, there's a resolution on packet page. Uh, well, actually you have it in, uh, in paper form or on an email, we updated that. And that's a resolution just to accept the plan that they're, uh, the re or the report that they're giving us today. So Katie, go ahead, take it away. Okay, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Hallis. As some of you may know, I'm the coordinator for the Community Food System Plan, which is a project uh, between the Tonkins County Food Policy Council, Cooperative Extension of Tonkins County, and lots of other <clears throat> contributors and collaborators throughout the community. Um, online and in person today, Don Barber's here as the chair of the Food Policy Council. Um, Baz Perry, my colleague um, at Cooperative Extension, the Agriculture and Food Systems uh, team leader, Graham Savio as well, who's the Agriculture and Horticulture Issues Leader and um, possibly even some other folks as well that I'm, I'm not seeing. So if it's all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Um, just bear with me one moment. Okay. Right. All right. Are you all seeing um, draft Tompkins County food system plan? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, excellent. I will get started here then. So thanks again for having us here today to share the draft Tompkins County food system plan, a roadmap for our future. Um, before we dive in, I just want to say that we really see this as a living document. Even as we speak, I'm still getting messages and emails from people in the community weighing in, giving us comments on how to improve the recommendations, uh, weighing in on you know, the food pantry system and how to improve transportation around food access. So it's very much a fluid process and um, it may never be final in the traditional sense. And as we build knowledge and understanding and identify evolving opportunities in this ever-changing system, it's really important for us to integrate that new information as we proceed. So why a food system plan? Why is this something that we need in Tompkins County? Um, climate change, equity, community food security are the central issues impacting our food system and the key areas that we wanna work in to transform. Um, this represents a huge opportunity to improve the lives of people you represent here in Tompkins County and to sustain and steward the land that supports us. Uh, this work is about creating synergies in a really complex system, and to do so, we need to be intentional, hence the plan. Um, so, you know, like the other elements that keep us alive, food is a necessity. Decisions about it affect us deeply, affect our well-being, um, and good plans can help with good decision making. So for all of the individuals, institutions, businesses, municipalities, and organizations that make up our community, um, they're all impacted by the food system. And as the food system globally continues to go through upheaval, all of these groups are impacted and some significantly. And this will only continue to intensify. Arguably, uh, people's quality of life is central to the work of local government and the foundation of our economic future. And so we want people, if we want people to stay here, live here, make a life, uh, we need to make feeding people, supporting local agriculture, providing opportunities in the local food economy a real priority alongside things like housing, jobs, education, and beyond that you're all working on um, currently. So whether it's the working families who are struggling uh, to put enough nutritious food on the table for their young kids, the more than 3,500 school children in Tompkins County who are currently enrolled in free and reduced price lunches and many of whom struggle to concentrate in class because lunch may be the only square meal that they're receiving that day, the local restaurants that have shuttered in the face of COVID, um, or you know the passionate young farmer who wants to feed her community but 
is on food stamps herself to feed her own family. Um, each of these people actually lives in our county and they deserve time, support, and resources from the community they live in. So I'm gonna put on my teacher hat for a moment here and ask you to participate and engage in the subject matter just a little more directly for a moment. Uh, food as a human right is this question and premise at the heart of what we're doing. Food touches so many facets of our lives and our community so many times a day. It really matters. So just mentally, um, let's take a minute and reflect on these prompts that you see here on the screen. Just kind of see which boxes you can check in your own mind. And then I'll just give us a moment and then we can come back together. All right, so wherever you fall on that spectrum, I'd like to invite everyone here to just recognize and acknowledge that nearly 12,000 of our friends, neighbors, colleagues, and family members struggle um, with this issue. I'll never forget during my time teaching at TC3 in the food systems program, hearing from my students about how they were eating chips between Friday evening and Saturday afternoon. That was what they had to eat because the cafeteria doesn't stay open during those hours. There are no stores within walking distance of campus and they had no personal transportation. Their struggles to then contribute in class on Monday um, became much more understandable given what they were dealing with. So even though these problems are systemic, we so often as a society expect people to deal with it alone. And if we can make this more of our responsibility as a community, we can end the cycle of shame that adults, students, children go through every day when they have to stand in a line and wait for a bag of free food that if they had the choice, they wouldn't buy for themselves or to have to face their fellow students and peers at the campus food pantry and the stories go on and on. Um, so I just really wanna ground this work in the actual reality of real people who, who live in our community. Um, just as a reminder, I wanna take us back briefly to the beginning of this process, which was to develop our first comprehensive understanding of our local food system. Uh, just as a brief reminder, here are some of the highlights from that process of what we learned um, in our work to identify the key challenges, vulnerabilities and concerns in our local food system. Um, to, to learn more and go deeper, I've linked the executive summary there below, but I just want to note that you know, these challenges they don't exist in a vacuum. Um, rather, they're inherently tied to the overarching system-wide weaknesses and inequities in our global food system. So as we go forward, we have to be considering our collective economic uncertainty. So everything from inflation to the fluctuating job and labor markets, as well as the impacts of an exponentially growing population. Also, our dependence on global markets and policies, areas where we're beholden to decisions that are made outside of our community. So, you know, a few examples include the Farm Bill, which makes um, industrialized processed food cheap, accessible, convenient, um, as well as economically competitive, and the threats to our food supply chain, notably the war in Ukraine, which some have described as a war on global sec food security given the important exports coming out of that country um, and the fluctuating and unpredictable food and energy prices. So next I'd like to walk through those three areas of focus that have emerged um, as most impacting the food system and the areas where we want to work towards change. So to begin with, if we wanna talk about addressing climate impacts in our community, which I know we do and I'm grateful that that's so, we have to talk about the connections between our food system and climate change. Importantly, the food system is a significant driver of climate change and is also extensively impacted by climate change, particularly the agricultural sector. Um, 
We recently had a report come out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just this spring um, with a focus on food security. And from that, we hear that climate change is already disrupting the world's supply of food and water more significantly than previously thought. And those disruptions will get worse. The takeaway from this report is that no one is left unaffected. And between the opportunities to mitigate climate change, which we see tied to the fact that our food system accounts for a third of global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the vast majority of that from agricultural processes, about 71%, as well as the fact that nearly every farmer we spoke to in our process um, talked about how they're spending more money, more time, stressing more about extreme weather related changes um, and seasonal shifts and climate impacts that are impacting the way that they are able to uh, go about their livelihood. Um, so we need to decide ultimately, you know, in the face of increasing food prices, the fact that we're seeing damage already to important food systems, infrastructure and agricultural areas that's going to eliminate our access to some imported foods entirely. Are we going to rely on this really complex global food system to pivot quickly so that we have a secure food supply? And if not, does our community have the wherewithal and the will to take action here at home? Um, no, just briefly, I want to note that uh, we know that we have the information, the technology, the knowledge to make the shifts that we need. This transformation is possible. We're just not yet doing enough. And some of the bright spots, sort of the agriculture of our future, um, include, as you see there, agroecology, agroforestry, and agricultural diversification. So much more to come on that, but I um, wanted to note that there for you. So in terms of equity, um, there are longstanding injustices uh, that impact local residents today. And we have to work really intentionally to undo and recreate policies and structures to dismantle systemic racism and systemic inequality in the food system. And that means prioritizing things like access to land, the means of production, increasing resources and economic opportunity and exploring the transfer and redistribution of wealth and power. This is also about fair wages and pricing. It's about access to nutritious food. It's about, it's about getting more voices at the table for decision-making and building understanding. There's so much more to explore in this area and I would encourage you to revisit the baseline assessment reports, particularly on food access and security and production. Katie, mm -hmm. can, um, can you go back to the- Absolutely. Or actually, no, that slide right there you're on. Um, mm -hmm. So just wanted to, when you mentioned earlier, uh, 12,000 people um, are food insecure. And then when you're talking about, say, the 12% of SNAP benefit uh, recipients, are you talking about Tompkins County? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, just wanna check on that. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. In terms of community food, sec uh, food security, too many people struggle with food insecurity on an individual level. There are programs and safety nets in place, but we know that they're not enough. Just the other day, I heard from a longtime volunteer at the Lansing Lunchbox, and she said, I had no idea how much hidden hunger there is in Tompkins County. In reality, we just haven't made meaningful progress on this issue for decades in our country. Um, and that largely mirrors what happens at the local level. The pandemic, as you all know, saw spikes in food insecurity as people's circumstances changed quickly and unexpectedly. And while this isn't a new problem, there are newer dynamics that we must factor in. There are these cracks in the global food system that are beginning to show. And the system is characterized by huge corporations controlling the vast majority of the food system itself. So, um, you know, COVID, climate change, the war in Ukraine, these are, these are all cracks that are beginning to give us sort of a preview of the types of shocks and um, uncertainties that we'll, we need to be able to weather in the future. Um, resilience is key to that, being able to weather that. And that means expanding our capacity locally and regionally to feed our people. Food security because of these systemic and rapidly developing dynamics is gonna become an issue for everybody. So I just want to take a moment here to bring in the voices of community members who 
help to create this food system plan and bring these ideas to life. The leaders, the advocates, the growers, the volunteers from across the food system who um, are really, you know, we are reminded that they are at the heart of all these issues that we talk a lot about. Um, they're the people impacted, they're the people struggling, working overtime to solve these issues and people who are driving the change, the innovation and the vision. I wanna take just a moment to recap our, um, our process here, our two year effort. Um, funded by you all and the Community Foundation to come up with our county's first ever comprehensive study and understanding of our food system, which engaged over 2,000 individuals, 50 plus businesses and organizations. Um, and like I said, this work is never truly done. We're still hearing from people. So in addition to having learned a lot about our food system, we initiated, continued and engaged people in what we know is a really important conversation about where we're headed and the community food system plan is a part of what emerged from that. And that's what we wanna talk mostly about with you today. The plan itself is a voluntary framework for future actions and collaborations going forward. It's structured thematically along these three directions to build resilience, cultivate equity and economic opportunity and promote human and ecosystem health. Um, the plan itself is rooted in local needs, but situated in this global context that I've been talking about. The goals, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, and the recommendations that uh, fit within those are kind of situated within these broader directions. And these directions came through strongly in our community conversations as if the community was saying, we really need to be moving in the direction of resilience, of equity and more opportunity in our food economy. Uh, you know, promoting and protecting our, the health of the people who live here and of the environment and ecosystems that we depend on. Um, so next I'd like to walk you through uh, the goals. There's nine of them and highlight for you the specific recommendations uh, that especially need support from the legislature and represent areas where you could play um, a particular role. Within this first direction to build resilience, there are three goals focused on um, addressing climate risks that impact our food system, increasing local production, and uh, really increasing the viability of local farms, and building the systems and structures needed to enable the kind of collaboration and support that we know is needed uh, to, to transform. Uh, the specific recommendations that I just want to call out here for you include supporting and promoting innovative programs such as payments for ecosystem services that really incentivize and advance efforts to farm in ways that protect our natural resources, uh, while also really supporting uh, the economic viability of, of farms themselves increasing efforts already underway to prioritize and protect land for food production and to expand that into new settings, um, committing resources long-term to food system planning and coordination and integrating food system actions that have been identified through this process, which is, um, you know, as I said, been supported by over 2000 individuals weighing in and helping us craft these goals and recommendations. And you know, really making sure that they show up in existing plans and work plans um, as, as appropriate. Um, within the direction of cultivating equity and economic opportunity, we're focused on seeing deep reductions in the rates of food insecurity by increasing access to not just any food, but food that's uh, affordable, nutritious, culturally appropriate, safe food that people actually want to eat that's preferable. Um, this also means growing land access and um, food production opportunities for folks who have historically been excluded from opportunities in the food system and in our community, given the disparities, that especially means focusing on low-income folks and Black, Indigenous, and people of color in our community and creating opportunities for more entrepreneurship, more investment, more innovation, and fair employment in the food economy. Some of those steps, uh, those recommendations for action include setting up a structure so that we locally can engage and influence what's happening at higher levels of government, 
strengthening land stewardship and equity supports and working to support high quality jobs and a skilled workforce in the food system specifically. And the last direction to promote human and ecosystem health, uh, we have what our goals are to focus on protecting natural resources with a particular focus on what we're calling climate smart practices, fitting within that overarching lens of addressing climate change, providing widespread opportunity for the whole community to engage in um, reducing food waste and enhancing food recovery efforts and to integrate broad nutritional support for a healthier population. Some of those specific recommendations include increasing water sampling, monitoring, and public education, especially given the interconnections between our water resources and our agricultural sector, um, encouraging and exploring new um, avenues for food scrap collection, exploring innovative um, opportunities to improve the food that is served in institutional settings, and also exploring innovative policy tools to provide um, better options and better opportunities for access to good food throughout the community. Um, so I'll just say before transitioning to the next uh, slide here that that's a very quick synopsis of some of what's in the food system plan and each of the recommendations has um, more ex explanation and description and I hope if you haven't already, you'll have the chance to explore those a little bit further. Um, you know, we've done our best to provide some insight into what it might look like to try to implement these actions um, while also leaving it open enough to be able to um, build this implementation phase, continue to build with the community. Um, so there's a lot more to explore with regard to the food system plan and I hope, um, you know, I hope you'll ask questions when we get towards the end here um, and continue to just get familiar with, with that document, uh, recognizing that there is a lot there, um, which is a product of how much we received from the community. Um, so I'd like to just wrap the presentation by talking um, a little bit about what's next. So community engagement has been central to this effort. Um, our approach for this next phase of the process is uh, focusing on the Tompkins Food Future Pledge, which you'll be hearing more about, and um, really using that as a way to grow food system awareness, spur new commitments, and to garner more support for the work and for organizations working in the food system. We'll continue to educate the public, sharing the plan widely, engaging new partners, and continuing to listen, learn, and support the work on the ground. And lastly, um, we'll continue our work to identify partners, um, identify opportunities for collaboration and to build those systems and the infrastructure needed to carry out the type of collaboration that's being called for. So none of these problems in the food system can be solved unless we work together. Um, Food system advocates have been doing incredible work for a long time here in Tompkins. And at the same time, we've struggled to make a significant impact. And that's because these issues are complicated and they require integration across a lot of different areas of work and sectors of our community. So everything from land use planning to economic development and public health, social and racial justice initiatives, public and higher education, local government, businesses, climate advocacy, I could go on. Um, we need really strong partnerships to address these challenges at their intersections and at their roots. And we need signals from leadership that this is a priority. So how can the legislature prioritize our local food system? Here are some of our ideas. Um, of course, read and give us feedback on the plan and how to make it better, pass a resolution, to accept the plan as that signal to the community that this matters to the legislature and it'll be something that gets the attention it deserves in the years to come. Um, in the coming months, consider funding requests to support this work going forward and signing on to the pledge. Um, in terms of a structure for collaboration, it's crucial to the sustainability and impact of this work to have a structure for the county and the community to have well-considered food policy actions that fit with the work that's already underway. 
We need channels of communication with legislators and staff to implement the food system plan, to grow capacity and strengthen coordination around the food system um, and improvement of it. We need to make sure that there's a structure in place um, to ensure community voices are heard by broadening the group of citizens engaged and expanding food system representation at, at the table. Um, this could take many forms and we wanna work with you to determine the best approach. I wanna say we deeply appreciate all that's been done, the support and the commitment already provided. And we're really looking forward to um, continuing the work to improve community health, advance sustainability goals, reduce food waste, support economic development, reduce climate impacts and strategically implement the county's comprehensive plan. Long-term, we'd be looking to integrate the food system plan into the next comp plan update and broadly looking for your support on implementing the food system plan. So I just wanna leave you with um, some opportunities to learn more. I've included just a few reports here that I think are well worth exploring. They are timely, comprehensive, and really helpful in just building more understanding of the nuances um, and going deeper into the issues globally, nationally, at the state level to really root what we've done in this broader context. Um, and in closing, I just wanna thank you all so much uh, for your leadership and support. Uh, for those who haven't heard me say this before, the Tompkins County Food Policy Council is one of about 325 food policy councils working in this space around the country. Um, in the last 10, 15 years, many food system plans have been adopted. And while it's a newer field of planning, um, and government policy, it's something that's taken off in the last decade with local governments making huge strides in improving local food systems and serving as essential leaders to really bring about the change that's needed for each unique community. And especially in a context where we can't always wait um, for you know, the support and the policy needed from higher levels of government. Um, we've learned a lot from other communities, read a lot of other plans, and my hope is that um, something in this plan can help shape our community's future and maybe even inspire other communities in New York State to, to take action and build towards something better. Um, I hope that, you know, you'll share your feedback, help us improve the plan and make it better, and I think we're ready to hear your questions and your ideas for moving forward. So, Thanks again so much. And I'll just, uh, I believe you have this in your packets, but please reach out. I'd love to connect with anyone one-on-one, -on -one, phone call, email, sit down together. Um, thank you again so much. And please let me know um, your, your questions. Love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Katie. I'm gonna um, first just wanna see if, you know, uh, you have some other folks here with, if, uh, if if there was anything else they wanted to add, if, if Don, uh, Graham, or Baz, was there anything else they wanted to, to add before we go put it out for questions? So I'll just add that Quad River Extension has been a really great partner in this process, mm -hmm. connecting not only with Katie as the coordinator, but also with Baz and Graham um, and all their connections has really been very helpful. Yeah, we're really glad that, uh, you know, uh, adding on to that, really glad that individuals plus the organization you know with cooperative extension and the council ha has taken this on i mean it's, it's huge and the, the timing you know starting before the pandemic and then going through the pandemic to 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 work and evaluate uh, this you know you've <laughs> not saying that we wanted to have a pandemic but we really i'm sure you really saw as we all did the stressors on our food systems that uh, um, were created by something you know as, as atrocious as this. So uh, uh, anything else other people want to add? Just okay. our thanks and we're happy to answer Baz, questions. Baz, go ahead. Now. I'm sorry, Baz, what did you say? Just to say thank you so much for your support. And, and we've, we've learned so much throughout this process and as someone who runs programs in the food system at CCE, I, I love the, the collaboration that we've been able to have. It's really informed our programming, 
um, and our direction as an organization. And so just nothing but gratitude and um, echoing what Katie said, just uh, please anybody reach out if you have any questions about the food system, whether it's the plan or just um, something you've read or something you're curious about, right? We're here to help you find evidence-based answers to all of your food systems questions. And so um, this integration of sort of all exploring what needs to happen and how to move forward together has, is wonderful. And I'm really looking forward to the future. And just uh, coming into the room, we have Monica Roth, and you also help work on this too, right? Well, Katie did the lion's chair. <laughs> okay, so we have Monica Roth here. They just finished, finished their presentation. Oh, was, <laughs> was there anything you wanted to, to say before we open it up to questions in the group? No, I just think it's been a great effort, lots of outreach over the last two years or three years, I don't know, two, two I think. And um, we've got a diversity of people who have weighed in from farmers to people who are food insecure. And um, I think, you know, there's always with a project like this, there's always more questions that come up along the way and more to learn, which is really the part of getting a plan done and then working towards implementation because we can continue to address the issues that come up as we move forward. Thank you for your support over these last few years to get to this point. And I think we're ready to transition into making things happen. <laughs> and for folks that don't know, Monica, she's so, she was, uh, I think, are you fully retired or mostly retired? Yeah, retired. <laughs> From Cooperative Extension, working a lot in ag and food. So do you want to join us at this table in case you want to comment as we're having our last yeah, part of discussion? We're almost over. I well, we're going to open it up for questions. Uh -oh. That's a legislator. So come and join us. Deborah Dawson, I see you have uh, your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Annie. Um, and thanks uh, to everyone who's worked on this. Um, I, I know that this has been an enormous amount of work um, on, on something that's a major problem for all of our residents. Um, that said, I guess maybe my question goes more to this resolution um, to accept this plan. I'm, I'm struggling to understand exactly what it is I'm accepting. Uh, when I accept the plan, am I accepting all these recommendations for legislative support? Because if so, I, I have some questions, some issues, some problems. Um, I appreciate that you all have been hyper focused on the food system. You know, as a legislator, I have to be focused on a broad spectrum of needs that have been severely exacerbated by the pandemic. And, and I have to address those with um, resources that are currently being strained uh, by the increasing costs of everything that the county uses to meet the needs of its constituents, whether through mandated programs or elective programs. Um, you know, and I look at some of these legislative supports and some of them, quite frankly, uh, aren't really in our power to regulate or impact in that we don't, for example, have land use regulatory authority. And Deborah, and, let me, yes, let me just while you're doing that, I just want to ask Brittany while you're continuing to talk Do you. Are you able to look that up? Don had sent us an email a little while ago or or is it just to me about what the word accept means to, because there's different levels of us accepting something versus, or, you adopting. Know, versus adopting. Okay, not adopting. And I don't have that language. My, my computer wasn't working quite correctly. So that might help inform you or, you know, so we'll bring that up. Uh, we'll see if we can find that um, language of what accepting means. So go ahead, Deborah. Yeah, I mean, um, okay, so prioritize, prioritize and protect land for food production. So now, on the one hand, we're looking at ag land, which has already been the subject of some really divisive debates about whether it should be used to continue agricultural use or to install solar panels. This is just an example. Um, you know, I, I, I am always troubled when people come to us 
with really well thought out plans to address a specific problem. Um, and yet, and I'm not saying none, that, that this isn't worthy. I'm just saying, I don't know how far we can go without butting up against the needs in another area. And that's always my concern with a proposal like this one. Um, it, which isn't to say I'm gonna vote against it. I'm just asking people to please consider that we have to fit this into a, a spectrum of, of other needs and wants and mandates that are demands on our county time and resources. So thank you. Brittany, were you able to find that of what it I did it, but Katie just sent something in the chat. Okay. Get back to the top. She said, this is the language, language we received a few months ago. Legislature rule 10 receipt of reports. The legislature may vote to accept in whole or in part the report of any person, consultant, committee, task force, or other group. Acceptance is hereby defined to mean that the legislature acknowledges receipt of the report and thanks its author for it. The legislature may also vote to adopt any such report in whole or in part. Adoption is hereby defined to mean that the legislature acknowledges receipt of the report, thanks its author for it, and formally commits itself to implementing the recommendations of the report. A vote to adopt does not preclude a legislator from voting in the future against the impl implementation of any particular recommendation of the report. The legislature may also reject any such report in whole or in part. This may be done either by voting down an acceptance or an adoption resolution or by passage of a resolution of rejection. Such a resolution means that the legislature has received the report and finds it unsatisfactory and or, and then it cut off, does. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, I'm trying to get the other piece no, in there. Okay. Thank you, that's really helpful. I have no interest in rejecting it um, and I'm happy to accept it. I just, you know, like right. I said, <laughs> we've so got a million things we got to deal with and I'm not sure that all these legislative support suggestions are doable. Right, so if we could go back to the very beginning of that and I'll, and I'll read again what uh, acceptance means so that uh, that's clear for folks. So the other things that uh, Katie had in there are higher level. So this is to me what I would call the lowest level. Uh, so acceptance of the report is defined as that the legislature acknowledges receipt of the report and thanks its author for it. Yep. So pretty to me, it's, uh, I hope that helps address some of the issues that, so thank you for bringing those up, Deborah. Right, so it doesn't mean that we say, oh yes, absolutely, we're gonna go into, for instance, that one, and we're gonna protect land and we're gonna do what we can at the county, which we talked about before earlier in the meeting when we worked uh, before you, some of you folks got here about as far as like building codes and zoning, you know, there's a lot of that the county can't can't do. To me, I kind of look at it as, um, you know, looking at, for instance, later on as we're updating our comprehensive plan for the whole county, then, you know, what parts of this can can we look at to, you know, to integrate in that or what supports could we give you along the way but this doesn't hold us accepting this. As, uh, and so please correct me if anybody sees this differently. It doesn't hold us to, hey, you accepted this. You have to agree with everything we said and you have to help us and you have to make it and fund it. It's just, thank you for your report, really. So any other uh, questions on that or, or, in, or in whole on, on, the, on the report? Randy? Uh, yes, just to report you, you talked about your OTR request. Can you talk about that a little bit? Just to... And if you have an amount for that, I think... And also what, what you would do with it in the first year. Is Graham able to speak to this? And this would be for, not for now, but this would be later when we're doing our budget process, exactly. right? In exactly. August, September. If Graham is not, <clears throat> then I will do my best. Graham, are you on? I, I am on. I'm I'm walking to the airport in, in Uganda, so I don't have the oh OTR in front of me with, with the detail. Um, I can say that the full amounts of the OTR request would be 34,000. 
And if Don or, or Baz or Katie has in front of them um, the, the text that we have, that might be helpful. Thank you, Graham, for reporting in from Uganda. <laughs> yeah, I think he just won a prize for the most remote, remote attendee in our history. <laughs> Don, did you want to add anything else? He said he thought it was about 34,000. Right, I don't have the text in front of me, okay. but this is for implementation. And this is would be uh, a one-year OCR. Right, so the, the plan would be that this would be an OTR for this upcoming year. And then after that, it would be built into the Quadro Extension budget. It'd just be what you sign on with an annual contract with Quadro Extension because mm -hmm. most of the programs will come out of there. So that's that's the plan. And we're also looking for philanthropic organizations and local businesses to support the programming with this. So it becomes a public partner, private partnership as it has been up to now. Right, and it will cost a lot more than $34,000 sure. and you're gonna get you know, so the if I if I'm correct, and the majority of funding will come from other avenues, and right? so this this funding from the county would mostly be personnel related. So for mm -hmm. Katie and for expanding the work that in Baz's group and so on mm -hmm. that we, that we are getting from Quaffer Extension. So and we really appreciate this because as we had conversations earlier, or you had initiated these conversations right. early on with 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 uh, with the county that you know to have the bandwidth you know, to do this and the staffing, we really appreciate, I, at least for me, my perspective, I really appreciate you and, and Cooperative Extension, you know, uh, agreeing to take on this coordination. So I'm not sure, Deborah or Henry, who had their hand up first? Uh, can I just follow up on, on what Don was saying about implementation funding? I wanted to be sure that, Don, that you and Baz and Katie got the email introduction I sent you to Jared. Um, Jared's been really, really helpful to us here in Tompkins County on a lot of fronts. And he did mention that Senator Gillibrand's committee work uh, gave her access to uh, some funding. Uh, and the things I remember specifically, Annie, maybe you remember better than I do. There was a lot of farm to table uh, right. funding and there was a focus with that kind of funding on schools, local school systems. So I really urge you to reach out to Jared and, and if that turns out to be successful, please let us know. Thank you so much for that, Deborah. I saw that this morning. And do you think it would be appropriate to share with him the draft food system plan as we- Oh, I think he start? would really like yeah. to see it, yes. Great, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you again. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks Deborah for making that connection You know, with Senator Gillibrand's office for uh, for funding i remember just going through the 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 list there was a lot of ag agriculture food related so you know funding so ho hopefully you know they can they can uh, help you out henry yes can you talk more about the um the the future advisory committee and advisory come out council that you were thinking about mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to pop back over to my slides briefly. Just bear with me. So there is actually a slight change between um, what was sent out in the packet and then what was shared today. Um, and I think, you know, to go back also to bring in, Deborah, um, your question and one of your concerns about, uh, you know, how does this with these recommendations, how much can the county actually do, especially around land use authority, if you accept the plan, what does that mean in terms of actually um, sort of triggering some action? And I, what I'd like to say, and I think it speaks to your question too, Henry, is that I think we are really committed to and really interested in and see the, the need to have some sort of formalized structure, whether that's a food system advisory council akin to the you know dozens of other ones that I know you all work with currently, or if it's something a little bit different that connects more with staff and department heads. I think what we really see is in order for these in, in order for these recommendations uh, to move forward, for this plan to move forward, uh, we need to have those lines of communication those opportunities to connect regularly 
um, with the folks doing all the work um, within the county and outside of uh, county operations. And so, you know, figuring out together what that looks like is something I think we'd be interested in exploring going forward. I can say that a lot of communities have sort of a hybrid um, local government community council or advisory committee in some way that really provides a connection between the community and the elected officials so that there's an awareness of the issues, there's, there's a back and forth. And I think that can also, you know, in terms of what we see um, being, being really helpful and important for really growing these efforts is really operationalizing it. So having it be part of someone's job to, you know, attend a quarterly food systems, you know, forum, um, so that, you know, as staff transitions and as new organizations come into the fold, that that is established. Um, so that's a long way of answering your question. I think there had been conversation about establishing a food system advisory council to the county um, so that, again, you know, you all could hear from the community and, and hear from, from us and being informed by the community. And I think um, there are other ways to structure that that we want to explore with you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I also had a question about the, and this is the specifics about the, the cost of food in Tompkins County being mm -hmm. higher than the national average, mm -hmm. and also the, the third of the people not being SNAP eligible. Mm -hmm. um, can you discuss that a little bit more in terms of, in terms of what's going on with that? Sure. Yeah, I, I can I can weigh in on sort of my understanding of it, just with the caveat that it's there's probably a lot more to it. But I think right. some of the key reasons that food just simply costs more here is because we are in New York State and things are more expensive in New York State. The cost of doing business is higher here in New York State. We are also um, and, and there's a lot to unpack here with regard to food system challenges. But because of our geography and also even our topography, we're sort of isolated. We are off of a main highway. It simply costs more to move the food around and distribute it. Um, so because, you know, we, we're kind of, we have that isolated location. We're not on Centrally a main highway. isolated? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, and also land is really expensive here. So any food that is produced locally is, that's also gonna contribute to that. And, um, I should have linked it in that last slide, but those figures come from the Feeding America report that gets put out every year. And I encourage folks to look at that um, if, if you haven't seen that before, but Feeding America is a national nonprofit that uh, tracks, monitors, and reports out on these types of, um, specifically around food security and access at the county level. So um, you can learn more there, read more about their methodology. Um, and there, there are several um, you know, data points from that study that we've included um, in this work. Okay. Including that, the including the one about SNAP too. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I was gonna yeah. ask you about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Randy, you're next, or or did you want to answer that so a just, little bit more first time? Sure, would, on the 17% increase, uh, our costs being that much more expensive, about 85% of the food that we consume comes from outside of our county, outside of our region. So we are impacted by federal and multinational uh, operations, getting back to the centrally isolated. So that's part of our food travels are roughly 1,500 miles to our plate. So there's a lot of reason why uh, the costs can be higher in Tompkins County. We'd be great if we were producing much more of it locally, because then we would take that variable out. And that's part of the goal of our plan. Thank you. 1,500 miles. <laughs> Randy? Uh, yes, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm new to the food policy, uh, and I've been very impressed with how collaborative it was uh, and how many people are really involved in, in entities, nonprofits, uh, for profit companies, retailers. Um, so I, really, I was really impressed with all the data that was collected. Uh, there's a lot of data. One of the data I think I saw, uh, to Henry's point, that a third of the people that are eligible for SNAP don't get it. I mean, there's also another group of people that could get it if they 
chose to. And maybe that's a communication issue, I, I don't know. Um, the, uh, one of the issues that I've spoken to, uh, two local farmers, one in Enfield, one in, in, in Newfield, and they have land that they could use. They don't have people to help them. So I mean, and it's good land. It's, good. it's land that would be very available. And I think there's a lot of unused land in the county that could be used. But again, it comes down to labor. And I think one of the data uh, that I saw was the average age of farmers is, mm -hmm. is not necessarily Increasing. young either. Um, so I, I just want to make that comment. So, so. Thanks, Randy, and thanks for uh, you know agreeing to work and you know liaison with 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 the food system folks. So I appreciate you doing it's that. It's been a real education, it really has. And I know you have a long history of farming in in, in your family too. Baz, thank you. Yes, I I wanted to just uh, add a little bit more detail to this very important point that about a third of food insecure households in Tompkins are not eligible for SNAP. Um, because that is the nation's food security system, right? And so I think it's very simple for the average person to say, well, that is the solution. Um, and and um, to sort of say, why is there more to be done with food security? Um, but a lot of households fall into um, what the United Way calls our ALICE um, households. And ALICE stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, and Employed. Um, and so especially with the cost of housing being very high in Tompkins County, with fuel prices going up, with childcare being extremely expensive, um, what ends up happening is that the food budget is the one that's the most elastic and needs to shrink in order to make way for those other costs. Um, in order for a family of four to qualify for SNAP, they need to make $46,000 or less. Um, so if you think about it, someone who's trying to feed a household of four on 50,000 is not getting any federal benefits from SNAP or WIC. And so those families need to turn to um, basically locally funded um, food security efforts. Um, Healthy Food for All comes to mind, as well as um, pantries that don't have eligibility requirements. Um, which are limited. A lot of the pantries also follow the um, SNAP guidelines and, and others. Um, so I think this is a conversation to have for sure, um, to make sure that whatever local resources we have um, are, are, are meant to supplement what the, the federal programs and state run programs do so far. Thanks, Baz. Katie? Um, Thank you. I just, I wanted to speak to briefly a, a point that you made, Randy, about uh, sort of workforce and, and labor labor issues and not having enough people. And I, I just wanted to um, affirm that and, and remind folks that in the baseline uh, assessment, we interviewed about 30 farmers and that was at the top of, and you'd see that in the narrative, but that was sort of a top tier challenge um, people just not being able to find um, a, a solid uh, a solid workforce that yes maybe they had some young folks interested in you know interning but there's just a complete lack of um, education and sort of training infrastructure to really help develop the next generation of folks um, who could who could become um, on farm workers and you know support this industry so I just kind of wanted to um, chime in on that that it that it's a huge issue for a lot of local farmers and something that I think we have um, some of the foundations of to support I mean we have existing programs we have TC3 Ithaca College Cornell where I think partnerships could be built um, you know programs could be developed to help develop that pipeline if you will. Um, to sort of build the next gener help help develop the next generation. I mentioned before, uh, again, before some of you folks got here earlier about uh, the Tompkins County Poorhouse and uh, how they had a farm there. And uh, there were some staff that worked at the Poorhouse. And also um, when I first came to this area, I worked at Willard Psychiatric Center, which also used to have a farm. And uh, there were a lot of the residents and a lot of the staff talked about 
how people uh, had a, a, a really great self-esteem, really great health when they were connected to the food, you know, uh, and uh, I know people that, that do farming. It's really hard. It's really hard work, but somehow we've gotten out of that. That's a, that's a path, you know, but it, it, it's, I know people, like I said, that do it and it's really rewarding, but it's, it's hard work. It's hard work. Henry. We, we can't hear you. There yep. you go. Yeah, I know. I know that um, you talked about the BIPOC community and it would, I know there's been some sessions in the, in the past about farming. And I was wondering whether there's what, what the sense is in terms of you know, you need workers, you have a BIPOC community that isn't farming, What's, what things have been done to try to connect those two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can speak to that briefly. And if others wanna jump in, please do. I mean, the, the beautiful thing is that there's a lot of incredible work underway and um, goal five within the plan, if you haven't had a chance to look at that, that's where a lot of the specifics would show up. And I think, what really came through in my conversations with people and our sessions with people is not that there's nothing really that we have to figure out or do or create. There are people already doing it. A few who come to mind include um, Amanda David in, in Brooktondale, who has a community, a BIPOC community garden that you all may know about. Krista Nunez, who um, is leading the Quarter Acre for the People project, which is about getting uh, folks on the land and finding, making connections between people who have land that they wanna share with people who want to grow food, um, whether for themselves or as an enterprise. And so really what came through is trying to look at the existing resources and how to build those out so that they can support people in these spaces. And also to do, to do more work ourselves to to listen and to learn and to get out of the way when we need to. Um, it, it's, it's such a long-term process that has to happen. And, um, you know, I, I personally think we've just begun the conversation. We've maybe only just scratched the surface, um, but really finding ways to, um, again, provide more support to the innovations that people are, you know, doing in their lives on their own, uh, you know, without, I think a big difference that is important to highlight is that so many of us are connected with well-resourced organizations and a sort of a history of programming. And then there are folks who are, are doing the work that we're talking about who, you know, for example, don't have a grant writing background. They're not connected to a nonprofit that's providing them a way, a livable wage and benefits. So I think it's, Another part of it is about, um, you know, finding people, connecting with them, figuring out innovative, like funding mechanisms uh, that aren't just about a uh, nonprofit to funder transaction. Um, there's some language in the plan about, um, you know, slow money movements and collectives and, um, you know, sort of alternative uh, investment structures that could help see the types of activities that we're talking about here. Um, so that's that's how I would respond there. And, and Baz or Don, if anyone else wants to weigh in, please, please feel free. Hey, I think that was uh, beautifully said. And I, every, it seems like every month or, or more frequently meet, um, someone who's been in Ithaca a very long time, who sees these issues and has found a way to start um, making change. And, you know, I just, I do see that um, the, the, it's your constituents who are making the change, right? Um, I just met a really nice woman named Billy uh, Soul doing work um, at Etsy Street Garden and uh, they're creating a cooperative for growing medicinal plants. Um, and that's a completely um, black and indigenous run organization um, who are growing their own medicine, medicinal herbs, right? And, and that's something that isn't going to come from legislation or policy change, um, but it is something that comes from communities being in touch with one another, right? So now that she's in touch with 
us, we can provide horticultural expertise. We can help with grant writing. Um, we can make sure that if they have extra food that they're in touch with a pantry um, and Friendship Donation Networks helps transport that extra food that's grown to a pantry to get to someone else, right? So it's, it's being at the crux of the work that other people are doing um, uh, that's so important. And um, I do see, you know, bringing more resources in as also one of the things that Katie and I can offer and, and the other folks at Food Policy Council too, right? And, you know, having these connections and having Deborah, you know, email us a connection to finding, to finding state funds, you know, those are the kinds of things that someone who's got their hands in the, in the roots and in the, in the dirt, they don't have to, um, to stop that work, um, to search for money because they can have a conversation. Um, with us, and we can help do that work for them. Thank you. Does, uh, Don? So I want to just do, uh, go back to Deborah's question about uh, acceptance mm -hmm. or an adoption of the plan. So we've identified that everyone, everyone is involved with the food system. So no one's exempt. And we've also identified a number of vulnerabilities and many of those vulnerabilities are way outside our county because it's a global food system. So we all are gonna be impacted as we can't insulate ourselves. And so recognizing that, then the food system plan identifies three directions. And those directions are saying that we all are gonna turn and face those directions to build resiliency, to create equity, and to have a uh, healthy food and environment. So that's, we're all saying that that's the direction we're facing. And that's see what we're accepting with an accept the plan. And we've also, when it comes to what's, what would be the county's involvement, well, we intersect with human services, we intersect with the health department, we intersect with sustainability, we intersect with planning, we intersect with so many different programs the county already has. So we're not asking the county to do additional, we're asking us to make sure that this is right up there with, all your, with your awareness of all the programs and so you stay focused on the food system that impacts everyone. And so accepting the plan means that we've done the work that you've asked us to do. We've identified the food, our food system and we have an idea how to move forward. And that's what, that's what we're asking for the county legislature. Mm -hmm. And just as you know, we talked earlier about you know, how broadband is important. And so I would po pose that food <laughs> is even more important. Okay, right so there. so it's really uh, so I I really do a thank you for all your work. Are, are we ready to go on to the resolution? Okay, so this is uh, again this is something. If you're here in person, you have it in paper. Do we have any extra copies? So Brittany's going to pass out some other copies to those here. So the only thing we changed was the very last line, just to make it more word friendly to go to the right to the legislature. So thank you for writing this out. We um, so let's get this on the floor. Uh, I'll move this. This is uh, ID one one zero zero four, accepting the Tompkins County Food System Plan, a roadmap for our food future, and that's seconded by Randy. And uh, I just want to say too, um, we had several conversations. I think uh, at least on this, and you've had some other conversations about do we you know, at the county, like, do we need to accept this plan? Do we want to ex accept, do we want to have any, you know, anything like this, accepting and adopting? So we've had some conversations here and uh, the folks on the, uh, the doing this work uh, said it was important to them that we had some recognition of, of a report, you know, to reiterate what was already said, we asked for this to work to be done. And so I really think it's important at this, this is the, the least that we can do. So uh, I'm gonna open it up for any questions uh, from the legislators. Okay, so we're ready to vote. Uh, why don't we go with uh, Randy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Deborah? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that passes unanimously. So I think we're all set for today. And thank you, thank you, thank you again. This has been two years worth of work, not saying you're, and, and I think this is a unique, just one last thing. This is really unique that we don't often have something where um, some, somebody is working on something that is also gonna then continue 
to Im implement this and work on this in, in the future. I mean, because other times we have had plans or reports and here, here you go. And then we have to figure out what to do from here. So I think this is really unique. I really value the work you're doing, uh, full service, so to speak. So thank you again, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Katie, Baz, Don, Monica, and, and Graham, if you can hear me in Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Gray, for all your work you've done. And uh, we'll, are you are you doing uh, just doing the resolution at the next legislature meeting, or are you doing I, a little I, presentation? We're doing I can't a remember. short, abbreviated presentation. Ab abbreviated presentation. So we had a nice long report here. We'll we'll refer people to to this, you know, so that they uh, are ready for questions. And you provided a great link in there. So thank you again, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Sorry. And thanks for some people coming in person. It's great to see you. And the next, I'll open it up. Are there any committee member reports? Deborah. Yeah, so I'm not sure of all the specifics of this particular issue. However, y'all will recall that we uh, passed resolutions, one or more resolutions opposing cryptocurrency, um, use uh, for the Cayuga Power, old Cayuga Power Plant. And most recently, I believe the IDA um, attached a condition to any um, tax incentives uh, th that would have involved using that facility for bit Bitcoin mining, cryptocurrency mining. Um, uh, rumor has it that the IAED um, is considering moving forward with um, pursuing Appalachian Regional Commission funding without limiting, uh, without imposing any limitation on cryptocurrency mining uh, for a broadband expansion to the Cayuga power plant. I just think we ought to be aware of that because um, my feeling is if IAED succeeds in um, pushing this through and gets the um, ARC funding and permits cryptocurrency mining at that facility, they will have pursued a, uh, an initiative that's directly contradictory to um, to county policy as expressed in resolutions that we've passed. And uh, I, for one, would be very public about pointing out that this is not something the county supports. I don't know what the rest of you would want to do about that. So stay tuned for future exciting developments. Do, do we know why they did not put in the crypt cryptocurrency? Well, my, under, my understanding is, is imperfect, but what I have heard is that the Appalachian Regional Council doesn't want to provide the funding if there's a limitation on how the broadband would be used. Well, thank you for bringing this to our attention, Deborah, and keeping it on our radar. Well, like, like I said, I, I don't have all the details. I don't have all the information, um, but I, I find this disturbing. Me too. Yeah. Any other committee reports? Okay. Um, I forgot to mention that there's just uh, an, an information item on packet page 45, uh, workforce development uh, budget a transfer for two laptops, uh, but that's just uh, information. And anything else before we adjourn for today? Okay, I wanna thank everybody and uh, being flexible to give, as it turned out, we were able to give the uh, food systems plan a bunch more time. So uh, I think it was uh, about 45 minutes, I think that we were able to give them at least. So so I was glad they didn't have to rush through their, their report. So thanks again, everybody. And we're adjourned for today. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye y'all.